618, and we'll be ready to go at the end of this message. Worship. Worship of the one true living God takes a lot of different forms, a lot of moving parts. There's music, there's prayer, there's uh, giving, serving others, preaching, reading scripture, hospitality, and this goes on and on. Worship can't be defined simply as, well, we worship at 11 o'clock. Worship uh, really involves, for the Christian, everything. Everything that we do, changing the baby's diaper, uh, fixing a flat tire, whatever we do, we do it as unto the Lord, it becomes <coughs> worship. Uh, as I said, there are lots of moving parts, but there's one thing that you will never, never, say it with me, never find in true worship. It is any measure of half-heartedness. No such thing in true worship. worship. In genuine worship, it is show up all in, ready to serve, or go home and repent. It's as simple as that. There is no ho-hum worship allowed. Matter of fact, if it is ho-hum at any point, it's not worship. Worship of the all-encompassing God can't be ho-hum. <coughs> I forget who it was, but uh, one of the great theologians said, the only thing that Christ cannot be is inconsequential. Believe him or not. You can't just ignore it. The Song of Moses, which is the psalm text that Elsie read, begins with instruction to the godly to sing for joy to the Lord because it is fitting for the pure to praise Him. And so the question for us becomes, who are the pure? Well, they are those who have been forgiven, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. That's what the promise is. When Jesus died, His shed blood, as we trust in what He did for us, His shed blood cleanses our very souls and makes us unguilty. Even though we are guilty, we are now forgiven. We're changed. So it is those who have been forgiven who are the pure, who are worthy to praise God. When we come to the table, the first thing that we do is give thanks, don't we? We receive, uh, before we receive the supper, we participate in the great thanksgiving, which has as part of it, actually the very first part of it, before we get into praising Him, there is the confession. We confess our sins. We do that silently for our personal sins, but we have a, a litany of words that we use, a ritual, if you will, that says uh, that we are sorry for our sins. Do you recall the words of pardon after we join in confessing our sins? Let me refresh your memory. The preacher says to you, hear the good news, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Isn't that what the preacher says to you when we have the confession time? And what do you say back to the preacher? In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. So everybody participates in confession and forgiveness. So at this table, there are no perfect people. There are no better than other people kind of people. There are only forgiven People. people forgiven because they've trusted in the forgiving, cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And they don't earn this gift. It is something that is entirely that, a gift. It is by the grace of God you are saved, Paul wrote in Ephesians. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, that doesn't mean that we're just the same as the unforgiven. Uh, I mean, we know better than the fact that uh, we... We're not perfect. I mean, by and large, forgiven people live their lives differently and from my perspective, better than people who are not forgiven. And that is the world's mistake. They look at Christians and imagine that we think somehow we're better. That we're, what's the old phrase, holier than thou? Uh, that's not it at all. The fact is we are just as guilty when we commit a sin, for instance, of, uh, oh, let's say stealing something. We're just as guilty as an unforgiven person, aren't we? How about the sin of adultery? Are we just as uh, uh, guilty?
guilty as the unforgiving person? Certainly we are. So we know better than that. But the fact is, forgiveness does cause people to look at life differently and therefore to live life differently. For instance, in Luke chapter 7, there's a woman of questionable character, an adulteress, who comes to Jesus and pours over his head a very costly perfumed ointment. And it was an anointing, it was an expression of her love. She did this because she knew her sins had been forgiven. But Jesus caught, perhaps out of the periphery of his eyes, the crowd watching. And they're very disapproving. They're clucking their cheeks and they're turning, you know, they're shaking their head. How could a prophet let a woman like that take part in anything he's doing? Why would he even allow her to touch him? Jesus turned to them, and this is what he said in Luke chapter 7. I tell you, her sins, and they're many. Did Jesus deny or diminish the sin in that woman? Not at all. Her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. What do you mean by that, much love? Well, what, he, what she poured on his head... That little bottle of perfumed ointment probably cost a half a year's wages for an average worker. That's a lot of money to spend on a lavish act of honor towards Jesus. But that's what she did. Jesus continued, She has shown me much love, but a person who has forgiven little shows little love. So the gift that we participate in at the table this morning is our chance this is good. It's our chance to be that woman. Because frankly, all of us have been forgiven much. We've confessed our sins. How bad is one sin compared to another? Is any sin worse than another? We might think so because maybe one sin causes more damage. You know, for you to be mean to me and uh, say something that hurts my feelings is not quite as bad as if you take an axe and you chop off my head. You know, so we would place sins in different categories from that perspective. Listen, sin is sin. How much sin does it take to make a sinner? The gift that we participate in at this table is to be forgiven much, is to be that woman. We've come to have our sins forgiven by the giver of the gift. And that gift changes us in so many ways. I want to center in for just a couple of minutes on three of those changes that happen because of the forgiveness of Jesus. Because of what Christ has done for us when we express our faith in Him. When we come to Him and we express our trust in Him. We place our faith in Him. We get changed in at least these three different ways. First of all, God invites those who have been changed by the gift, forgiven, he invites people like that into his presence. What does the scripture say about the presence of God and sin? They're not going to get together, are they? God will have nothing of the presence of sin in his presence. Now, as much as God's word declares that there is no condition upon which, is he, which he places on people where his love is concerned, doesn't he say that in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave Jesus to everybody. He doesn't place conditions on that. But as much as His Word declares His unconditional love for all the world, it is balanced by His commitment to justice and righteousness. God was willing to have His Son Jesus take our stripes on the cross so that we could be forgiven and gain entrance into God's presence. But for those who reject the cross, they also reject the forgiveness of God. I was telling the children that I had this uh, aversion to eight-legged creatures, the arachnids, the spiders. I don't like spiders. But you know what? I'm less afraid of spiders than I am of not being accepted at the throne. To me, that's everything. It's everything. It's often asked, and it's been asked me many times throughout the years, why a loving God would send innocent people to hell? The fact is, two things. First of all, there are no innocent people. 
Romans 3.23, 6.23 tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah says that uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. But he also said, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they can be as white as wool. What does he mean by all of that? Well, God doesn't send anyone to hell. When we choose our sins over repentance, we choose to go to hell. God created hell because there needed to be a place where people who reject him don't want to be in his presence, need to, need to go for all eternity. What this table represents is the gift of Christ's forgiveness that changes us from enemies towards God to friends with God. We are the precious ones invited to be in his presence because we have been forgiven. That's what the psalmist wrote about when he said that the pure, it's fitting for the pure to praise him. A second change that comes over us besides being invited into the presence of God is that we learn to forgive other people. I ran across a great quote this week by C.S. Lewis. Um, and it simply says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. What did Jesus tell his disciples to do? As I have loved you, love each other, is what he said. Me, and did he put condition on that? No. Did he mean only those who are um, in church every Sunday? Did he say only those who never robbed a bank? Only those who aren't homosexual? Only those who, you fill in the blank there. He didn't put any condition on that, did he? We are to act with love towards everybody. We are to forgive other people because it's not our place to judge, is it? When we come to the table, it is just as open to a former axe murderer as it was to Mother Teresa who did so much good. I read in the Catholic Church in the 1960s, it was a prominent church in a very large city. And... Uh, uh, you know, had a lot of refined, well-to-do people there, and every Sunday the church was full. And one, this one particular Sunday, the church was stocked full. There was not a seat to be had. All chairs had been placed out here and there and everywhere, and uh, there was not a seat to be had. And just as the service was beginning and the choir was warming up, in walked a young fellow, beard, long hair. Back in those days, they called him the hippies. You know? talking about me these days, but, uh, but he reeked of alcohol, reeked of pot, reeked of this and that, and he certainly had never been in a church before, because he looked around, he didn't see any seats, and so he walked further up, he didn't see any seats, he walked further up, he didn't see any seats, big church, all packed, not a seat to be found, so he walked all the way up to the front, and he said, well, no seats uh, with cushions on it, so... This looks as good as any other place. He just plopped right down at the front. You're going to watch the show close up, right? He didn't know what church was all about. But this elderly man walking with a cane had kind of followed him up. And everybody, when they saw him, they thought, oh, it's Dr. Henry. He'll get rid of this hippie. He'll get, you know, he'll get him out of the building. Maybe just show him to a back room or something. You know, just get him out of our sight here. Service will be okay. When Dr. Henry got up, even with the young man who was sitting there in the middle of the aisle on the floor, he took his cane and leaned it against the pew. Then he grabbed onto a pew. And he got down on one knee next to the guy. And then he did the strangest thing. He sat all the way down right next to the guy, put his arm around him, and sat with him through the entire service. What's the meaning of something like this? Dr. Henry was a forgiving person who knew that it was not his place to judge somebody else. He put his arm right around him and said, I'll sit here with you during this worship service. And that's who we need to be. And that's the kind of change that takes place when we are children of God who are ready to welcome somebody else to the table. The gift changes us from enemy to friend of God and forgivers of others. But there's a third change. Forgiven people see worship differently. They see it as truth. That's what Psalm 33 said. The psalmist said the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything he does. Listen, in a world in which you and I see precious, precious little, 
that is true and dependable. Here's a God who kept his promise of redeeming sinners like us even at the price of the blood of his precious son. That's a God that is worthy of worship. We see truth in worship. We see it differently than we used to. We also see a means of joining in the blessing of God. This table, John Wesley said to uh, the followers of the Methodist movement a couple hundred years ago, he said, participate in the Lord's Supper as often as you can. Not only because there's truth, but because this is the blessing of God. This is a means of grace. As we participate in this table, we are participating in the grace of God. We are stirring up the grace in us towards other people. This table is meaningful to us. The Revelation shows two great themes about this fact of the grace of God and stirring up the blessing inside of us. First of all, there's justice. In the Revelation, the text that Elsu read just a little bit, while ago in, in chapter 15, it says that the bowls of wrath are being poured out on the earth, the justice of God, the judgment on sin for those who refuse to repent. And incidentally, isn't that the next great event that's going to happen? Is there anything that has not happened that must happen before the second coming of Christ? No. The second coming of Christ is the next thing, and he's coming next time, not as a babe in a manger. He's coming with a sword. He's coming with an army, and he's going to set at right that which has been wrong. The next great event that's coming in history is the day of the Lord, his judgment on sin. That is justice. That's God's commitment to justice. But there's also thankful worship. We see that what is happening in heaven in the meantime before he comes and will happen after he comes is thankful worship. And it's those who have stood straight in their faith in Christ, both here on earth and now in heaven. The covenant God of love, his unfailing kindness and mercy, have drawn all who love Christ to his throne. And God's people respond on bended knee, and raised hands, and lifted voices, singing, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. In this great worship scene that is taking place in heaven right now and will throughout eternity, the redeemed church is praising God for being redeemed, saved forever. The Song of Moses in the Old Testament, which we read from Psalm 33, and the Song of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, in the New Covenant, celebrate the same thing. They change us from enemy to friend of heaven. They change us, helping us to participate in the forgiveness of other people as we share the good news with our friends and loved ones and family. And that change proclaims his truth in worship constantly as we come to him. This table is our opportunity to proclaim exactly what he has done. To offer the genuine sacrifice of praise. So let us break bread together on our knees. Let us drink wine together on our knees. Let us, as the psalm says, praise God together on our knees. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.